So I'm Alumas. Uh, my name is, nobody can really pronounce my name, so I put it up there for you. It's pronounced Yair, um, based originally from Israel. And I've been, a, I'm obsessed about data infrastructure for the past 15 years or so. Um, I'm now a Lumos founder and CDO and uh, trying to help people that are obsessing about their data infrastructure. Uh, before that, and this is actually what I'm, the story that I'm going to tell today is my story at Convert Media, which is an advertising technology company uh, in which we have built a lot of data infrastructure. Uh, this is going to be a repeating concept. And I spent 12 years in the military before that, uh, also building a lot of data infrastructure. Um, and I am, like I said, excited to be here. So in, in Convert Media, we were an advertising technology company. Does any of you here work at AdTech by a quick show of hands? Yeah. So you should know there is a lot of data there. Uh, we started by building an ad server, which is a, started as, as a very, very simple thing. Let's just have a server that every time a user wants to see an ad or something wants to show the user an ad to be more accurate, um, they would get, the server would get a request to show which ad to show and then would just spit it back out. And would count what, what it displayed in this MySQL database. And this is how it started. And then the business grew a little bit. So every time the server was down, we were losing money. So we had to start uh, enabling notifications on top of our log. So we had all of our events going to a log and then some workers that were flagging notification if we should get up in two in the morning and do something about the business losing money. And then we wanted to start doing some fancy data science stuff. Uh, so we put all the data in Hadoop and then also in, data, in HP Vertica at that time, so like all up database, and then started running all kinds of machine learning on top of it to be able to display smarter ads. And then eventually we also needed more metrics and more dashboards, so the data was going also into a time series database. Uh, and a caching layer because the volume became too big. And over time, this became a really, really complex system. So essentially, every event that comes in was duplicated to all of these places. And then our, uh, the, inf the industry of change a little bit, and real-time bidding, uh, there was a hint there, real-time bidding was in introduced, uh, which essentially people said, instead of prepaying for all of this empty space, we want to choose in real time, do we want to display an ad, and how much do we want to pay for it? So essentially what happened is every time there is an opportunity to display an ad, a bid request is coming out, and there is Google as an exchange, and uh, Microsoft were investing up next as an exchange, and Yahoo had an exchange, so there were, all of the big companies were in this game. They would give all of the bidders the opportunity to say how much are they going to pay now to display an ad right now to a specific user on a specific URL, and our job was to give a price back. And essentially what we said, okay, we build a really, really fancy machine learning um, on our Hadoop cluster that would predict how much we are willing to pay for an ad, so let's put it into action. So it started with a key value store just to get the data on the user and on the, and on the uh, URL that we're currently going into. And we had like a billion keys there and we had to return a response in about 20 milliseconds. So it was a lot, 300 million in the US, which is basically the US. Um, Attic is everywhere. And as you can guess, uh, it got complicated, <laughs> similar to the ad server, because also notification and monitoring, and then batch ETL. And what made things even worse is that these things had to talk to each other as well. Uh, so suddenly the bidder need to speak to the ad server uh, database to understand how much money was spent on the campaign and if it, can it now bid, or the ad server would need to ask the bidder some things and then the models were pushed from one Hadoop cluster to the other and it became a whole mess. And as you can guess, this really, really, really cannot scale. Um, and you, I'm guessing that at least some of you are in that spot today. So one, one reason it cannot scale is discrepancy. So every event is multiplied into m many different things and they could never agree with each other. So if I stick to the, to the campaign budget, so essentially every campaign has a budget and it can spend this amount of money per day. If you spend more money, nobody's gonna pay you for that money. So you don't want to overspend because it's money going out of your pocket. But it's 
really hard to overspend and to make things even worse, the customers are looking at one dashboard that's coming from one database, the application looking at another thing, billing goes from the application, and then you get very angry customers asking you why they paid, why we wanted them to pay, not what was actually displayed. And then, as well, so no two systems here was ever willing to agree with each other, and we were really struggling to understand, okay, what is really data? And this is wrong. Um, recovery from failures is really hard as well, because the state is being stored in a database. I'm not sure if any of you have ever used uh, my ISM table to store state. They probably encountered this error. If they haven't, they should thank, thank their lucky stars. Um, but the, the point is that if the state is lost, it's really hard to recover it. And not only it's hard to recover it, but the application keeps running when the state is lost. So going back to my campaign story, five minutes of no state can actually just throw, ruin the entire margin for the entire day because we were just spending money that is not accounted for and we would still need to pay this money. And then what happened is that solutions like, and this is a real solution, people are creating a slave that has an artificial lag built in, so if you have a disaster, you're really quickly hot swapping to the slave that has the lag where the disaster didn't happen yet. And again, this is wrong if you're doing that. And I was doing that for a long time. Um, and then I think we replaced every key component of our system at some point. So it feels a little bit like a heart transplant while everything needs to be connected while we pull one piece out and then try to put the other piece in and then really quickly take all the pipes and connect them to the other piece. And, and then if you have, and then of course all of the applications that are talking to this new infrastructure, let's say you want to replace MySQL for Postgres, uh, still needs to be functioning and keep talking to each other. So you need to deploy all of the code in the same time, and if you have a bug and you need to revert, then you're really in a bad state. So replacing a key component is really, really difficult when in this type of, of infrastructure. And this is another thing that we have spent a lot of time doing because, for example, for the key value store, we were using Voldemort, which was an open source project a while ago. Then we replaced to MongoDB. Then we replaced to AirSpike. Every time when the scale grows, we need some other tool. Um, so eventually, that's what's going on when your business grows and you have more applications and more applications and more applications, and then some more, and then they talk to each other. And then maybe you even have more. Uh, and I'm sure some of you know this state very intimately. And I've been talking to, ver to pretty much, I don't know, 200 big companies in the past year, and many, many of them are at this position. And what I'm thinking is that there has to be a better way. And, and I think it's important to say, I don't think that I'm going to say anything new here, so I apologize up front. I think it's all been said, but I think still it's not being practiced. So people are not taking the smart things that people have been saying over the years and merging them into let's build a framework and let's build it that way so that we can really stop obsessing about all this. And the industry have changed and the tools that we have available to us now have also changed, so we can do it better, and we should. So this is the path to sanity, and I'll try to go over it like one, one by one. So number one is never duplicate events, and do an event sourcing instead of state source. And this is a very simple concept. It's also a very old concept, but it's somewhat hard to implement, uh, essentially. Instead of doing the create, update, read, delete, normal database interaction, just treat everything as an immutable set of events. And everything that happens in the world is an event. And then put everything in an immutable event log. Instead of trying to update five different databases with the same event, where two of them fail, and then you don't know what to do. And this has more advantages over just not duplicating events. For example, and, and also remember that the database table is essentially an event log. I mean, if you look at any database, what it has is an event log. The table is just a syntactic sugar slash beautiful representation of this event log. But under the hood, it's really an event log. So why let the database do the abstraction for you if you can just do it yourself? Um, and then let's say, consider the difference between saying, this campaign has spent $10, so add $10 to the spend, 
or we're saying set the total spend to $110. Because the first one can be reverted. The second one cannot. And let's say, and there is a big, big problem of bot and fraud in the ad tech industry. Let's say you need to cancel an event because it was a fraud. If you did a set, you have no way to do that. But if you did just the append only, you can just discard it and then recompute the state. So whenever you have, a, you have an event log, you can reprocess the state. And this is useful also for events coming out of order, which is also a very common problem with asynchronous messaging systems, especially with sometimes difficult connectivity for many, many, many different clients. And it is very, very useful uh, in case of failures because, again, the state, the materialized view of the state or the representation as a table, for example, can be recalculated again and again and again from the, from the source data, always. And if it's uh, heavy processing, you can always, um, if it's heavy processing, you can always just save intermediate states. But you can always recalculate everything from beginning while having its event log. So the pass to sanity number one is use an event log and materialize the views for this event log every time. The number two is take, essentially get rid of this. So this is, a, uh, there was a very uh, famous paper called Beating the Cap Theorem uh, by Nathan Morris that was displaying this uh, Lambda architecture. I'm sure some of you heard of it. Uh, unfortunately, the Cap Theorem still stands, if you're wondering, uh, and still holds true. Uh, but the idea was we have some things that we want to parse in real time and some things we want to parse in batch. Let's make a speed table and a batch table and have the application query both so that we can, um, so that we can always have the data that we need in real time in real time and what takes a long time to process, uh, we can process later. The problem, so what I like about this approach is it keeps, it's holding true to the event log. So every change is in immutable states and all of the benefits that we've discussed in previous slides, that's great. However, it means you need to maintain your code in two different places that does two different things. You need to maintain two different distributed architectures. So let's say you do the batch on Hadoop and the real time on uh, Spark stream. And it means that you need your code in two different places and it needs to, and you also need to maintain two different very, very complicated systems. Now the underlying reason was that people thought that the streaming uh, things are not capable enough to handle large volume of events. And also that the, guarantee, the semantics uh, guarantees were not good enough. So I think I've heard someone saying, hopefully once yesterday, um, in uh, hopefully once processing of, uh, of events, which is probably what most people do. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, good uh, stream processing frameworks today, and they can deliver pr probably the same guarantees that you can get from batch. And it can probably be fast enough. And you, if you're still doubting this, just think of Uber surge pricing calculation. They need in real time to know where all of the drivers are, where all of the cars are, and get out the price in real time. And they, pro and they do it over their streaming infrastructure. So, so I assume that not many people here have such a big uh, stream of events coming in. And then the streaming architectures that we have today are probably good enough. So essentially get rid of this and just do the real-time processing. And, and this is also not new. Uh, this was, they stopped working. <laughs> this was uh, mentioned uh, by Jay Krebs uh, about two or three years ago already. Uh, all right, I got it. Then the, the third path to sanity, and I think this is the most important piece, is to abstract the data layer. And 15 years ago, when we wanted to start a software company, the first thing we had to take care of is a server room and power and cooling. And we had to worry about how much power we have in the server room. In fact, when I was in the military, our biggest problem with every project we did was that the server room did not have enough power. Every time we tried to put our server there anyway, because they needed it, the power would fail. And then the generator would kick in. And then people would, be, would get pissed. Um, but today, our lives are so much easier. We only need to think about our application patterns, how much memory we need, how much CPU we need, how much storage we need, and we just provision it magically on the cloud. We don't care how Amazon does their cooling in the server room. We don't care 
which how hardware our server is running on. We just don't care. Um, and this is just saving so much time and money and enabling us to start building stuff so much faster. Um, and then the next layer of, of abstraction was uh, the application server layer. So we don't even deploy our applications anymore. We just put them in containers and push them to the cloud, and it's so easy. So in Aluma, for example, if a developer wants to showcase a feature branch, they just push the Docker to the cloud, and then everyone can look at it, and no need to deploy anything anymore. But every time we think about data, it's backwards. It is backwards. So we are thinking about our data infrastructure instead of our data access pattern. We are still thinking in terms of the power and cooling of data when thinking, do I need to use Cassandra? Do I need to use MongoDB? Do I need to use HDFS or Hive or whatever? This is the power and cooling. What we really need to think is, what is my data access pattern? Do I need a 20 millisecond response time over a key value store? Do I need, um, do I need to run a very big query over a year of data? but it can run in 30 seconds because it's for some kind of a report. Uh, unfortunately, we still don't have the way to do that. So this is, the idea is to move to an API layer and have an API layer. So from here, where we have all of these different applications and every application is essentially talking to all of these databases to here. So we have our applications, they are pushing all of the events into the event log that we have discussed. On the event logs, there are materialized views, but they are being materialized also through an API layer that abstracts the infrastructure itself, but only uh, talks in terms of uh, requirements. So for example, I need a 20 millisecond response time, and then the API will know, okay, I need to put it in a key value store. Or I'm going to need to run a MapReduce type of job, and then I can push it into Hadoop. But again, the point is, the, the application should not care what's implementing this key value store. It should just be provisioned automatically according to the volume, according to the required response time, according to, what, to whatever you may need. And then when building application that way, a lot of the issues that we are experiencing can be alleviated pretty easily. So failure recovery is pretty easy because we can recalculate the state and discrepancy is virtually non-existent because there is only one sort of truth. Now there is one caveat to that, that some services that we use are not working that way. So let's say we use some SaaS provider for one of our applications. Let's say we use Salesforce, and we store all of our sales data in Salesforce. Salesforce is a transactional database. It is not talking in events. But then we can build, actually, a gateway layer for, and, and it's amazing, it was already told in 2005, we can build a gateway layer for all of these services that will either use webhooks to post every event, and some of them do, or just pull it every such and such time and put the change as an event. This is a little bit clunky, but it's the best you can get. And this also lets you go back in time. And then, so imagine we have all of our cloud services over here and then another layer of connectors uh, to be the gateways for these services. And that way, even external things that happen in applications which are out of our control completely are also adhering to the schema of putting everything in event log and only display materialized views. So these are the layer of abstractions that, that eventually I have in mind. And we discussed the event log. We have a lot of, and, and Kafka, I think, is becoming de facto a solution for the event log. And I think more and more people are just using that uh, as the event log. Processing layers are still more diverse, but I think maybe the biggest ones, probably uh, Storm, um, Spark Streaming, and um, Samza, probably covering most of, the, most of the use cases. But we are getting better processing layer and Kafka streams, of course, with better uh, guarantees. And then we can build some common services. So things like schema repository, there is no need for every application to build its own schema repository. We can build a schema repository service that sits on the event log and stores the schema. Or, for example, notification handling, every application builds its own notification mechanism. If we just had a service that handled notifications, all of the applications can just talk to the service. So some, build some common service and then connectors where the views are being materialized on the different places where the data needs to be processed. Now it is still okay to do some post-processing in batch. In batch. So for example, if we do want to run some job that will take a very long time, it's okay to put it, to do it in batch processing way, just let's not do it twice. If we need to do it twice, once 
on the stream and then once in batch, then we were doing something wrong. Um, so if I want to recap, the three main things that the way I think we should, we should build our applications today are let's prefer event sourcing over state databases and let's just do a pen only. No updates and no deletes and no um, just, uh, just append. And then merge the real time and the batch infrastructure into the real time infrastructure because we have good enough tools to do that today and that the time has come to abstract the data layer. Now, this, um, this talk is not about Aluma, but I do want to mention that this is what we're trying to build. This is why I founded Aluma. I, I'm, I'll be happy to talk about it later with anyone that is interested. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, just raise your hand. I'll come over to you with the microphone. So, so again, I, uh, I prefer to talk about the general uh, streaming frameworks. This will hold true to Alum as well, or does. But essentially, the, the problem is just, it's just a trade-off of how much money you're willing to put. So essentially, the frameworks today exist where they really have a scale-out architecture that you can add more servers and handle more throughput. As long as you, you, know, you don't have crazy partition case requirements, you can just add more and you can handle. And I've seen deployments that does anywhere between you know, 10,000 to 200,000 events per second. And I've heard, but not seen with my own eyes, also about million events per second. So uh, the frameworks doesn't really have this limitation. Yeah. Well, so what you're building sounds like it kind of removes a lot of the interdependence between data scientists and data engineers. Do you see data scientists as potentially working a lot more autonomously within this kind of environment? Yeah, and, and this is actually, I really like this question because what we've seen, what I've seen in many of the people, I've data scientists I've been talking to, is they're getting really frustrated, especially in bigger companies where engineering is really separated completely from them. So they have to beg to IT resources to get some data. So yeah, for sure, part of the thing is to set the data scientist free. And, and again, if I quoted the, uh, I quoted M. Driscoll at the beginning of this talk. So the headline of the article was Madison Avenue, please set my data scientist free. So I really believe in that. Yeah. With m multiple people materializing the event log in multiple different ways, how do you keep track of all the different materializations and figure out what it is that you've materialized? So the question was, what should we use to materialize with all the different infrastructure that are able to materialize the views that exist today? How do you keep track of what everybody's doing? Oh, yeah. So that is hard. <laughs> but I mean, eventually, you can categorize them to different options to do things. And then it, once you categorize them, it takes time for you know, a new player to really be much better at this specific thing than the existing things. And, you, it's hard to keep track of it, that's right, but it's better be done by someone where that's their business comparing to having to track on it when my business was to build a real-time bidding engine. All right, thank you.